We are back on The Spin Room. Thanks for staying with us. U.S. President Donald Trump claims he would, quote, totally be willing to shut down the federal government unless Congress authorized $5 billion to fund his long-promised wall along the U.S. border with Mexico, according to a Politico interview published this week. Here's what they're saying on Capitol Hill. There's a deadline. November 30th is the deadline. Uh, Democrats know that deadline as well, and so they've got some decisions that they have to make. Are they going to shut down the government because they don't want to keep America safe? We are for strong border security. We've made numerous proposals. Number two, the $1.6 billion for border security negotiated by Democrats and Republicans is our position. We believe that is the right way to go. Third, if there's any shutdown, it's on President Trump's back. Will Trump follow through with his threat? I know exactly who to ask. Joining me now are Nate Lerner, executive director at Build the Wave, and Brandon Straka, founder of the hashtag Walk Away campaign. Thanks, guys. It is great to see you both. Um, Nate, let me uh, start with you. What do you make of this shutdown threat? Well, this is just politics as usual, which is really a shame because Donald Trump came in promising to drain the swamp, promising to make a difference, promising to cut deals and get things done. And after two years, we've seen more of the same. In fact, we've seen uh, even worse. Uh, this would be the third government shutdown if it happens. He's demanding $5 billion for a border wall that we have absolutely no need for because net immigration from Mexico is at zero right now. We're losing as many immigrants as we're gaining from Mexico. And it's, it's absolutely shameful that, you know, he's someone who campaigned on, I'm going to come in and make all these deals, and now he can't even make a deal to keep our government open. And it's, it's you know, you really were hoping for somewhat better, I guess, but, you know, we're now we, we, we get what we have now, which is complete chaos and just another disaster waiting to happen as a result of his policies and inability to work with the other side. Okay, Brandon, I want to ask you this. Uh, 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 there was a recent uh, poll by uh, Morning Consult that uh, shows that voters don't want shut down over the wall issue. 55 percent of registered voters said increased wall funding would not be important enough to warrant a shutdown of the federal government compared with 31 percent who said it would be. So, uh, Brandon, if he does this, the administration really is going to take a lot of heat for this, isn't it? Well, I think the administration will probably take heat. Both sides will take heat anytime there's a government shutdown. I think in general, uh, people don't like government shutdowns. It's not a great solution. We always prefer when the government is functional, when the government works. But in response to what Nathan said, uh, I have to say, you know, there it's totally untrue that this this wall is unnecessary. I, he, he said there's no need for it. I'm not exactly sure where he's getting his statistics about Mexican immigrants. But let's remember that below Mexico, there's this whole vast region called South America <laughs> and an enormous caravan of people from South America recently just came up throwing rocks, trying to jump through the border. And we don't know who these people are there. Recently, it was discovered one of them is an MS-13 gang member. So, yes, our security in this wall is incredibly important, and I do think that the president's doing the right thing, digging in his heels. Nate, uh, I want to show you a quote from a, a, a Mark A. Theosin op-ed today in the Washington Post. It's about negotiations in the government. It says, if Democrats are willing to make concessions such as funding the border wall, they will find that Trump is willing to buck conservative orthodoxy and make major concessions to them. Indeed, if they play their cards right, they can wrap up wins on everything from health care and taxes to infrastructure and even immigration. So, Nate, would you agree with this assessment? Should Democrats play ball, maybe? Well, Democrats are already playing balls. You heard from Chuck Schumer. They're offering $1.6 billion for increased border security. And this is what this whole fight is about. So I don't really know where Trump and the Republicans are coming from. Uh, they want more money for a wall. If they can't do anything with $1.6 billion, then they shouldn't be running our government right now. Um, and if you look you know where we need where we need those resources to go. We still have issues with transportation and opioids um, and the VA, um, just to name a few. And it, it, they just keep insisting on this wall that we really don't have a need for. And yet, Democrats have come to the table, and Republicans and Trump have been absolutely unwilling to work with them. And what they're asking for in return are things that are good for the country. But Donald Trump really doesn't know how to cut an actual deal, as we've seen. And our government has already shut down two times in his two years already, which is, is quite a bit. Um, 
and I think it would be nice for Democrats, and I think they should hold some ground on demanding protections for Robert Mueller. It'd be really fantastic if Donald Trump could meet them there. He's claimed that he has no plans to fire him, so he should really back that up with legislation. But Mitch McConnell continues to block any legislation from being passed in the Senate to protect Mueller. Um, and there, there's just this, this odd obsession with the border wall, and we have so many other issues. You know, a massive portion of California just burned down. It'd be really nice if we invested some money into re re rebuilding our country instead of building up a wall that we have absolutely no need for. And studies have shown we really won't do that okay. much to actually protect us anyway. Brandon, what do you think? Would you agree? Do you think Democrats are interested in negotiating at all? Uh, no, I don't think that Democrats are interested in, in negotiating at all. And I have to say, listen, uh, having a wall or not having a wall, does, it's not an either or proposition. Of course, there are many other problems that Americans have, and there are a lot of other issues that need to be solved. Having a wall doesn't mean that we don't solve all other issues. We have to look at all the problems, of course. But I'm very curious where Nathan lives, because... You know, it's very easy to say, oh, we don't need a wall, we don't need a wall. Well, tell that to people along the southern border who have been the victims of crimes, who have been had family members who have been murdered. Uh, tell that to the children who are being smuggled, uh, human trafficked over the border. Um, it's very easy to say we don't need a wall when you live like me in New York City, where we're kind of impervious to these issues and the fallout that happens from not having a secure enough border. Okay. And not to mention the threat that it puts our own ICE agents in, the people who are trying to do their jobs, who aren't properly funded and don't have the proper security that they need. Okay. I want to move on uh, to our next topic. U.S. Senator Rand Paul, he's under fire for placing a hold on the U.S.-Israel Security Assistance Auth Authorization Act of 2018, which provides Israel with $38 billion in military aid over the next decade. Pro-Israel groups such as APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and QFI, Christians United for Israel, have attacked Rand on social media and email blitzes as a result. And the money is expected to eventually be handed over, uh, and Rand has since, since explained his stance. He says, while I'm not for foreign aid in general, if we are going to send aid to Israel, it should be limited in time and scope so we aren't doing it forever, and it should be paid for by cutting the aid to people who hate Israel and uh, America. So let me, let me start with you, Nate. Is it just the issue of uh, foreign aid in general, or maybe does Rand Paul have a problem with Israel? I don't know if Rand Paul's a problem with Israel. I think he has a long history of being against foreign aid and wanting to reform it. Um, so I do understand where he's coming from in that regard. Um, that being said, there really, this really isn't the time and place for this argument or fight. Um, you know, we are dealing with a potential government shutdown. We're dealing with a lot of other problems in our government right now. Um, and he seems to be the only representative who's concerned about this issue. Uh, this, the, um, the funding aid passed with flying colors um, in the Congress. And now he seems to be the only one who's holding things up um, and bringing up a fight that we really don't have a need for right now. Um, there is some validity to his argument as far as discussing um, how we use our, our foreign aid and for how long and, and putting restrictions on it. But at the same time, Israel is our strongest ally in the Middle East. Um, they're one of our strongest allies in general right now, especially as Trump continues to push away a lot of our, our other allies. Um, we're becoming more reliant on them. Um, and so it's, it's the last thing we should do right now is, is jeopardize that alliance or, or put them in a weaker state. Um, so we should absolutely pass this funding aid. We should absolutely get them the funding they need for their military. Um, so I don't, I don't fully understand where he's coming from in that regard. And I think he needs to you know, move on from this issue and, and maybe bring it up at a later time and have a larger conversation <laughs> about it okay. instead of holding up the legislation that we need to pass right Brandon, now. Brandon, what's your take? I actually don't disagree with pretty much anything that Nathan just said. Um, I do think it is kind of an odd time, and, and dare I say he may be virtue signaling a little bit, but I'm not exactly sure what he's virtue signaling about. He seems to be making some kind of a statement. Um, I don't believe that it is an anti-Israel statement. That mm -hmm. I don't believe. I do think that probably is uh, keeping in alignment with his previous position that he uh, wants to be very cautious about how we spend foreign aid, and I think he makes a good point. Why are we giving so much money to Israel and then turning around and giving money to Israel's enemies. Um, I mean, that's a good point. And as Nathan pointed out earlier, we have a lot of problems here at home right. domestically. We may not agree on the wall, but you know, the money could be spent a different way. Okay, let's move on. Uh, no big deal. That's what Ivanka Trump is saying about the report. She used a personal email account to communicate about government business. Revelations have drawn comparisons to Hillary Clinton, who during her 2016 presidential campaign was dogged by questions about her use of a private server for emails when she was Secretary of State. In an interview with ABC, Trump says there is no comparison at all. There really is no equivalency. 
all of my emails that relate to any form of government work, which was mainly scheduling and logistics and, and managing the fact that I have a home life and a work life, are all part of the public record. They're all stored on the White House system. So everything has been preserved, everything's been archived. There just is no equivalency between the two things. My emails have not been deleted, nor was there anything of, of, of substance, uh, nothing confidential. Brandon, is she right? No comparison at all? I don't think there's any comparison at all. I mean, as she said, the one thing I was concerned about as I was researching this story was, uh, was she using a private email server? Because I, you know, I would be fair and say, you know, what a stupid thing to do right after, you know, we've made such a ruckus about Hillary Clinton, but that's not what happened. This was a private email address and all of her emails are copied to the White House archive. So they're there for anybody to see. Also, she hasn't deleted 33,000 emails mm. right after being subpoenaed after a major scandal. So, um, no, I really don't think that there is any comparison whatsoever. And I think that this is just the left once again wanting to pick a fight with the Trump family and, and you know, start a problem where there isn't the problem. <laughs> Nate, you have to agree that there is a big difference. As Brandon said, 33,000 emails were not deleted. So I don't think it's, it's, it's not about the semantics or the specifics of this story. It's kind of about the larger principle that it represents. It's after, you know, literally a, a year of dealing with the, the email scandal with Hillary Clinton. You know, we see it happen with the Trumps. And it's just the audacity of it, you know, the, the hubris that she has to pull off something like this and then just wave it off as a, as a, as a non-scandal. Um, it's just, it's really insulting and just so absurd. It really reflects the kind of state that our political system is in right now. And it goes, again, to illustrate um, how we really blew this email scandal so out of proportion with Hillary, how absurd it was. And it's just another reminder of that. And again, if you look at all the scandals the Trump administration has been caught up in, this is so minute in comparison. That's why it's really not become a bigger story and only become so um, out of irony. Um, but if Hillary had done a fraction of the things that the Trumps have been caught up with in the last three years or four years, um, you know, she would have never even been a presidential contender whatsoever. And okay. emails would have been nothing by comparison. So I think it's really kind of the irony of the story is what is, what is drawing so much attention. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, there's nothing ironic about it. I mean, Hillary Clinton was directly implicated in uh, being responsible for the deaths of four people due to negligence and then covering it up after the fact and then deleting 33,000 emails uh, in response to that. So to compare that to uh, Ivanka Trump having a private email address where she's, you know, planning her travel back and forth and, and you know, her Uber receipts, I, I think is really, really, really insulting. And uh, but I do do agree with you that I think it is the biggest scandal that this White House has happened. So we do have an agreement on that, that uh, okay. the left once again is trying to turn nothing into something. Uh, just a quick response from Nate. I want to ask you quickly about Michael Cohen, who uh, pleaded guilty today for about lying to Congress. How do, what do you think this is going to uh, take uh, the Trump administration? 20 seconds. Well, I think it's, it's going to be so haunting for Trump to see someone so close to him uh, now working with the FBI and working against him. Um, and it's very satisfying on my end as well. And I'm sure as many Democrats <laughs> to see that. So I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from this. Okay. I'm sure it's a bit less satisfying on your side, Brandon. Would you agree with that just in one word? In one word? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. Guys, thanks for coming on the spin. We really appreciate it. That's it for us. I hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks for taking a ride with us on The Spin Room. Hope you hop on again Mondays and Thursdays, 4 p.m. New York. That's 11 p.m. here in Tel Aviv. In the meantime, hang in there.